From Anchored in Faith Gospel Church in Oxford, Iowa, this is Anchored in Faith. We have what I, and I'm going to, I guess, call this series the Traditions of Men because we have a lot of traditions in the church that we do and we don't think a lot about them. And we're like Israel. Israel developed this over the centuries, the same thing. By the time of Jesus, you know, they were following what was called the traditions of men. And Jesus uh, had a lot to say about that. So I'm going to introduce this with what Jesus said about it. Um, in Mark 7, 8, he says, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And then in Matthew 15, 19, or 15, 1 through 9, he says, uh, Then Jesus came, and came Jesus to the scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth the father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father and mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father and mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of men, of God, of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah the prophesy of you, saying, The people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, this is familiar stuff. We've heard this before in Sunday school and in church about the, the Pharisees washing their hands before the meal um, and this type of thing. And so this is the kind of thing that had crept into Israel and a lot of it came out of the Babylonian captivity because they were cut off from the temple, they were cut off from the scriptures, they were living in Babylon, they were trying to survive in a pagan country, and so they started uh, doing religious things that weren't necessarily, you know, part of the law of Moses. So when Jesus says, for example, uh, the washing of pots and cups, See, in an Orthodox Jewish home today, you have two sets of plates, two sets of dishes, two sets of cooking utensils, because they separate the meat from the, meat, from the dairy stuff. And that's based on one scripture, and that's where it says you don't take an animal from its mother and boil it, cook it in its mother's milk. Well, they've made this whole thing, if you know anybody that's Orthodox, Jewish, you know, I mean, they go to great lengths to keep all of this stuff separated, and it's not necessary. It's not really the law. They don't need to do that. It's a simple commandment. You don't take the baby goat out of the herd and turn around and cook him in his mother's milk. Okay, that's all it is. And they've made this over, they've made this through all these rabbinical, you know, pronouncements and all of this through the centuries that you have to have two sets of utensils and you don't. See, and this is the kind of thing Jesus was talking about. And this other part here is about people, or it says, when he's talking about honoring your father and mother, you're supposed to take care of your parents all their lives. That was the commandment, not just when you're little, but when you grow up and they're elderly, you were to take care of your parents, you know, when they couldn't work and couldn't farm and couldn't do. And these, 
the Pharisees were taking their wealth and pledging it to the temple and saying, well, you know, my money's tied up in the temple. You know, I can't, I'd be offending God if I took any money back and you know, help my parents. So they're pledging their wealth to the temple and they're not taking here, their, their parents are destitute. Well, Jesus calls them on it. He says, you're supposed to honor your father and mother. And he says, you've taken, and of course, when they pledged their wealth, they were patted on the back. Oh, you're a great, you're a good guy, you know. You're a, uh, you know, really spiritual because you've given everything, all your stuff when you die is going to go to the temple. Well, this is not, this is making of no effect the law of God, which is honor your father and mother. And that is a lifetime People don't understand that, but that's a lifetime commitment. When you're grown, like I said, you're supposed to look out. They didn't have nursing homes back then. They didn't put people in homes. They didn't put people in facilities. They took care of their, supposed to, their parents and their grandparents and all of that. So Jesus is saying, you know, you violated the commandment here. And they didn't think they were. They thought they were being very spiritual, very holy, very religious. And that's the kind of thing he's talking about. So with that, we can say, well, what are our traditions? You know, we're here in the church. What do we do that may not be of God? That's a tradition. Well, in the Pentecostal churches, you have little traditions like and one of my favorites is baby dedication. Boy, I tell you, that drives me nuts. I've seen more people up here, not here, but where I've been, dedicating their baby boy. And you know who should be dedicated? Is mommy and daddy. They're the ones that don't get dedicated because they go out and live like they want. And they come up and bring their baby up here and get dedicated and all this stuff. And they go out, they're gone. See? And, but they feel good. It's a feel-good thing. It's a substitute for baptizing that baby is what it is. Since we don't baptize infants, a lot of people think, well, you know, I'll, I'll do that, and that'll be, you know, that one just, you know. And I understand, Sam, it comes, you know, Samuel's mother took him to the temple and dedicated him and all that type of thing. But his mother was dedicated. She was a, a godly woman. And so that's the big difference is that the majority of the ones I've seen, and you probably too, if you've been a pastor, you've dedicated babies and never seen the parents again. So, you know, and so that's the kind of thing that goes on. And it's okay. I mean, I, you know, it's not a huge thing, but it's just something that's just everybody accepts that we do. So. Linda got me thinking about this business of the name of God because about the same time I was thinking about it, you were thinking about it. And so we're going to look at something here that I didn't know, I found out. Now we, we know that in the book of Exodus, of course, Moses goes to seize the burning bush. He's out herding his sheep. And he sees the burning bush. We all know that story. He goes over and the voice speaks to him out of the burning bush. He says, take your shoes off. And they have this conversation. And he says, you're going to go to Pharaoh and get the people free. And Moses says, who should I ask has sent me? And the answer is, I am that I am. The I am is who I say is, is the name of the God. A better translation is, I will become whatever I will become. Now, in Hebrew, that's written a certain way. That's written as Y-H-V-H, -H, because there's no vowels in Hebrew, only consonants. That is the only name for God given in the Bible. The only name that you ever see in the Bible. 
But yet, we use other names. We use Lord, and we use God, and we use Jehovah, and we use all these other names in our worship. So why are we doing that? And we were saying, Linda and I were talking a couple weeks ago, that we said that Baal means Lord. Baal is the Hebrew name for Lord. And we've already looked at the book of Judges where everybody was worshiping Baal. In fact, Gideon's other name was Jerubbaal, which is Baal plus something else. And they were always doing, they were naming places after Baal, they were naming their children after Baal, they were naming all sorts of things. There are 63 different references to Baal in the King James. So Israel was just steeped in this, this worship. And we said this is not, this was more of a worship than just putting an offering in front of an idol. There's all sorts of rituals, there was sexual things going on, there was drug use, alcohol use, all sorts of things connected with these worship of these other gods. But Israel just constantly is using this God, you know, they have this double-mindedness that James talks about, you know, Yahweh's for up here for the big stuff, you know, the wars and the famines and the you know, the uh, pestilence and all that stuff. But day to day, we're down here worshiping, you know, the God of the, the nations that are right next to us. See, we worship like everybody else does. Now, what does that sound like? Sounds like the church, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like what we do? We do it, you know. We absorb that culture that's around us. We all do it. I got one finger at you and three at me, but we all do it. We're out there and we absorb things and we include them and we don't really think about what we're doing. And of course, Israel, I mean, their whole history is idolatry of one form or another. So what happened is, when Israel was called out of Egypt and the priesthood, you know, the Levites were chosen and all of this, almost immediately the devil started working to corrupt that, especially the priesthood, because they were supposed to be the spiritual leaders. So you had all of these, you know, priests who are supposed to be leading the people and yet they're acting like these other nations. Look at these two Levites in the book of Judges. You know, the first one, well, he's, you know, he'll work for anybody that's got the money. He makes idols, he makes uh, ephods, he makes all sorts of things. He runs off with the tribe of Dan, they go up north, they set up their little idol and do their thing. We have this, these corrupt priests already in the book of Judges, and that's not very far from Egypt. They don't even been in the land a hundred years or so when, when the book of Judges was written. So there's this constant war to corrupt the leadership, not just the people, but the leadership. And that goes back to what Jesus said about the war in heaven. Now, sometime down the road, we'll talk about the war in heaven. But the war in heaven is constant. It's always going on. It's not a one-time event. The war in heaven is going on right now. Uh, even though Satan, you know, gets cast down and everybody thinks, you know, that's it. This war goes on continually. And Satan is trying to corrupt these priests, and he's trying to corrupt the leaders today in the church. Look at the church people that have fallen. Yeah. And you know what? I'll just say this. A lot of them were in trouble before they got in trouble sexually. Uh -huh. 
But all of this just goes on constantly. And ministers are they're under a lot of pressure. I understand. You know, you, you try to stand up for God, especially in this world. I mean, I'm 67. And the changes that I've seen in my life from, you know, when I was a kid and what went on, and there's always been sin. That's not the, the thing. But so much of this is just accepted and exposed and it's out there and, and we're supposed to look up to it and, you know, it's okay and, and, and you got to, you know, go with the flow and all this stuff. This stuff is just amazing, the things that are, you know, there now from when I was young and you can probably say the same thing. But there's this constant war against Israel and her priesthood, to corrupt the priesthood. So what happened was with this, the business of Baal is that the priests also had another group that went with them, the scribes. Jesus said, beware the, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the group that were supposed to copy the scriptures. That was their job. There's no printing presses. So if they made a new copy of, of the the law or whatever, it had to be done by hand. And it was supposed to be, everything was supposed to be copied faithfully, you know. And that was what the scribes did. And they did other things. They did legal documents and all of that. But that was their main calling, was to write out the scriptures and keep new copies, you know, in circulation and all of that. Well, about a generation before they went into captivity, the scribes got this idea that the name of God, Yahweh, Y-H-V-H, was too holy to be spoken. So we, we can't say that. God would be offended, even though, and I'll give you some scripture for this one, God says in Exodus 3.15, this is my name forever, Zechariah 13, 9, call on my name, in my name, my name. There's only one name given. So they get this idea that, well, you know, it's just, we can't say God's name anymore. And so what they would do is they would, as they copied the scriptures and they came to the, to the name of God, they would write it. And they would make a notation to say something else. And they wanted, of course, now these people have been influenced by, again, the nations around them. And they want them to say, uh, to call God Lord. But they don't want to say Baal because they know that'll be a giveaway. So they use the word Adonai. Adonai is a Hebrew word that means my Lord. So they would make a note, don't say YHVH, say Adonai. So they started saying Adonai. And they're saying my Lord, they're saying Lord. And so this goes on and on. And pretty soon, everybody in Israel pretty much is calling their God, Lord. And so this is a corruption that's of the priesthood, the corruption of what they're supposed to be doing. The King James never uses YHVH. It only uses the Greek word, kurios, because the King James was translated from Greek. So they used the Greek word kurios. And they never use, you know, YHVH in the translation. Now, the Latin Bible that the Catholics use, which is the, called the Vulgate, they use the Latin word dominus for Lord. But they're all using Lord. So, you know, this is something that's 
we do it all the time now. What do we say? Lord, help me. We need to change our thinking. You know, I, I've changed mine. I, I only say Yahweh right now. That's all, I, that's all I pray. Now, what about Jehovah? Okay, that's another one we see. Now, you're talking, this is a guy that was raised in the Watchtower and Bible Track Society. The Jehovah's Witnesses. I heard every day how, you know, this is the name of God and all of this. And, and not only that, how the Watchtower restored the name of God. See, they were the ones that came around and, and made it. Well, they didn't do that. But that's, their, that's what they say. They restored the name, the true name of God. Well, the name of Jehovah only, it doesn't appear in any language and it is an ac it's a, it's a it's an ac it's not an acronym it's a combination of Adonai and YHVH. Well, why did they do that? Well, this monk in the 13th century in Spain just decided to do it. He's and see you, you have to understand the Middle Ages. The church controlled the scriptures. The people didn't read the scriptures. They didn't read much of anything because most people couldn't read, but you didn't sit down with your Bible in church and read. The priest would read to you from the scripture and give a sermon or whatever, but you did not read the Bible for yourself because number one, it was in Latin and most people didn't read Latin and you just it just was not allowed. So this guy just decides to make up this word. And then in the 16th century, we start seeing it published in the Catholic Bibles as Jehovah. And so again, we come down to this with this name that's used and it doesn't even exist in the scriptures. So Again, we have this corruption going on. We have people hearing things and seeing things and absorbing things around them because the scribes, you know, they wanted, see, everybody wants, everybody wants peace. Everybody wants to get along. And Israel, one of the biggest things that she failed at was to completely remove these Canaanite nations from the land. That was one of the biggest things that Israel failed at. And because she failed at that, they have these little pockets of pagans. And you know, you gotta say, I have to say this, the worship of Baal was very attractive. Shall we say it that way? It's like Hollywood, very much. A lot of sex, a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking, a lot of fooling around, do what you want, no consequences, uh, all of that. That's very attractive. Now, you know, we're just flesh and blood. And, you know, when you're looking across the fence, supposedly, at the Canaanites and you see them doing their thing, that's attractive, you know? And so they're, they want to get along. And God said, you can't get along. You have to separate. And so this is what, you know, has, has gone on. And this is why the, by the time of Jesus, you had all of this stuff that had crept in. And when they went to Babylon, oh, they fell in love with Babylon. They liked Babylon. They were in exile, that's true. But after a while, you know, they got comfortable. You know, I mean, the Babylonians didn't really, really mess with them too much. They let them worship. It's just like the Romans. You could worship your gods in Rome. You know, you could have your little gods in the house. You could worship however you wanted. As long as you acknowledge theirs, you know, and said, you know, yeah, okay. I'll acknowledge Jupiter and, 
and, and like that, and then you go worship yours. So they got very comfortable in Babylon. And most of them, <coughs> that's why most of them stayed. They didn't go back when they were allowed to. When, when the Persians came in, they let them go back. Most of them stayed in Babylon. But there was this communication that went on between people in Babylon and people in Israel, and all these traditions started coming in, and by the time of Jesus, you've got what we see. And, you know, this washing of the hands and stuff, that's not necessary. That wasn't, there was washings in the, in the, in the law, but not before every meal. But you know, the reason they did it is because, well, you know, I've been out in the marketplace and I might have rubbed against a Gentile or I might have rubbed against a dead body or some woman that was having her time. You know, that all made you unclean, see? Well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but they were doing it to be just, you know, in case, just in case, I'm going to show God that, you know, I'm thinking about it. Well, and they had all these other things, you know, you could travel a certain, uh, you, you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath, but you could travel a certain distance, and it wasn't considered work, and all of these things that just, you know, came about. And so, by the time of Jesus, they were following these and not the law. And what did Jesus? He came to call them back to the righteousness of the law. And, of course, they rejected him, but that was what he was there. He said, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who I'm sent to. And then, of course, they rejected him, but the Gentiles, you know, came in. But you know, that's who he was sent to because he was trying to call them back to the basic law of Moses. And they wanted to follow their traditions. You know, their traditions were meant more than the word of God. And so we have in the church, again, we've absorbed things from places that we shouldn't. There's really not much, you know, conviction. It's all touchy-feely, and we've said that before, but, you know, it's because we're like Israel. We want to get along, you know. We just, we've absorbed this culture that we're in, and it's hurting us a lot as a church, and, you know, that's what's been going on. That's what, that's what the war in heaven is about. That's what all of this, we talk about spiritual warfare and, and you know, war in the heavenlies and all that. It's going on right now all around us. So with that, we'll close. You have a great week in the Lord. I mean, in Yahweh. <laughs> See? <laughs> Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 52322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa.